Okay, hi. I'm Dave Israel from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and it's great to be here. I'm, a, I guess, a longtime uh, member of the NASA DTN team and the Space Internetworking team. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, uh, some of you may have heard in, in the news that back in September, NASA launched the LADEE mission uh, to the moon, and on board that uh, mission was a uh, laser communications uh, uh, demonstration, uh, the LLCD Lunar Laser Com demo. And, uh, it, and it went so, so well, actually, during the test phase that uh, I was able to, to slip a DTN experiment into, uh, into the, the mission, get some bundles riding the, the photons to the moon and back. So uh, what we have today is uh, uh, Don Cornwell, the, the mission manager from, from LLCD, is going to give the first part, talking all about the LLCD's optical comm experiment and success. And then I'll tell you all about what we did with the DTN. So, Don? Thanks, Dave. So as you know, I'm the, uh, the mission manager for the physical layer, so to speak, and uh, Dave will be for all the uh, higher layers in the stack, as you'll hear about today. And uh, this is the uh, LLCD mission, uh, uh, mission concept here. It's uh, very straightforward. You can see uh, what's met here. So this was a mission of first. Uh, the laser communications demonstration itself was the first high-rate high two-way space laser comm uh, performed by NASA. It, we flew on the Laddie spacecraft, which was built at NASA Ames uh, right across the 101 here, or actually not even uh, further down the 101. And some of the team is in the back. I was, uh, had the pleasure to talk to them a few minutes ago. We launched on September 6th. Uh, it was the first uh, flight to the moon from uh, Wallops Island, where we were uh, launched from on the east coast of the United States. And we also launched, it was our first launcher as well, uh, on the Minotaur 5. And it was a one-month uh, transfer orbit to get to the moon, and then we had a 30-day laser comm demo in a 250-kilometer orbit, and then we've turned the spacecraft over to the science team to do three months of science, and I'll uh, give you a quickie update about what's planned after that. But here's our mission architecture. This is kind of a busy chart. I don't want to go over the, too much of the comm details too much. I'm certainly happy to talk to anyone afterwards about this, but I want to point a few quick things out. So here's the Laddie spacecraft. It's about a meter and a half in diameter to maybe two meters tall. This is our physical space communications terminal here, the optical terminal. It's got a four-inch telescope, a 10.7-centimeter telescope on a gimbal, a two-axis gimbal, and it's about a one-foot panel by one-and-a-half-foot panel that you see right here. So it's a very small system. And uh, the first thing I want to point out is the technology that we're using from the electro-optics side, we're actually using commercial uh, the wavelengths and components from the commercial fiber communications industry. So the same components that power our internet backbone at uh, 1.5 microns in the near IR, our erbium amplifiers and all those systems, they're the same ones that we actually uh, flew to the moon because the parts are readily available in, in uh, volume at low cost and we could just basically upselect the ones that we uh, wanted to use. And so I think that's been one of the big breakthroughs that we had here. The other thing I want to point out, and I'm going to bring up our other stations, uh, this is our spacecraft uh, here, if I can get my mouse up. This is our primary ground terminal, which is at uh, White Sands, New Mexico. It's a NASA facility there. But we have also two other ground terminals, one at NASA JPL and one uh, contributed by the European Space Agency in Tenerife, Spain. And uh, so you'll note from this that we're actually doing this laser comm experiment through the Earth's atmosphere. And so not only is optical communications technology, laser comm, a disruptive technology, but it is also a heavily disrupted technology uh, because of uh, the presence of the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere. And so this is uh, why uh, DTN is such a wonderful uh, uh, complement to optical communications in the future going forward. Uh, so the, just to, to give a quickie, and then Dave is going to tell you more, the, the three, there's basically three timescales of the atmosphere that hurt us from a disruption standpoint. There is atmospheric scintillation and fading that happens in the millisecond time scale, and, and we take care of that in our hardware with our error correcting codes and channel interleavers. And then there are, is the uh, delay of going to the moon and back, which round trip is two and a half seconds. That's basic uh, high school science. And then finally, uh, we are very susceptible to clouds when they come by, and cloud outages can be seconds to minutes. And so I'm going to leave that to Dave because that's where his DTN came in and worked its magic for us. So let me go to the next slide. Uh, this is one of our rovers as uh, taken by one of our orbiters that w with an image that's one foot resolution. And here it is on the surface of Mars at the edge of Victoria Crater. And then Victoria Crater is buried down there somewhere in the southern hemisphere of Mars as we see it here. So we're at Google and 
If we wanted to do a Google Maps uh, of Mars at one foot resolution, uh, that would be about uh, 1.6 petapoints that would have to be collected. And at one bit per pixel, if, we, if you were going to use the best radio system that's been flown by uh, NASA JPL to Mars, it would take uh, nine years at five megabits per second to get all that data back. So you'd be uh, quite a while to get that. And as a matter of fact, it's, it's not well known, but, but basically uh, only 5% of the, the uh, actual available uh, time for our instruments at Mars are actually used because the other 95%, they just don't have the pipe for it. But if you could do 250 megabits per second, uh, as has been proposed by NASA's JPL uh, team as well for a design that they're looking at called DOT, you could get all that data back in nine weeks. And so uh, the, the higher data rates that are offered by optical communications will allow us to help uh, break this bottleneck. But again, just remember, I said that the optical comm does have that issue with clouds, and so DTN is going to be a, a, a key part of anything we do in the future, in my opinion. So uh, one other reason to consider optical uh, this is kind of a fun chart where uh, you, you look at, uh, compare equivalent isotropic radiated power, which is a way to normalize the effectiveness of different uh, transmitting systems. And so here's one of our beloved uh, NASA Deep Space Network antennas, the 34-meter antenna. It's an S-band system, which means it's uh, at a carrier wavelength of uh, our frequency of 2 gigahertz, and it takes 20 kilowatts to transmit that, and that has an ERP of 8.3 gigawatts. And you can see it's this big antenna. And here's the terminal that we flew on the LADI spacecraft. It's a 10 centimeter, four inch space terminal. It's at optical uh, wavelengths, which means that the frequency is at 200,000 gigahertz or 100,000 times uh, uh, higher in frequency and, and commensurately shorter in wavelength. We had a one half watt transmit power and the ERP is exactly about the same, eight gigawatts. So, so you can see the effectiveness of going to shorter wavelengths, higher frequencies here. And it's because you can concentrate the energy from a laser much better than you can a radio system. And then, of course, this is the part that's not necessarily fair to the RF team, but if you compare us in size, we're a, we're a lot smaller. So, <laughs> so, so we actually were able to, to use that advantage on the LLCD mission as well. This is the mission I'm talking about today. And this is the, uh, the state of the art for radio systems that's been flown to the moon by NASA. This is the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It was flown in 2009. It had a KA band system that could do 100 megabits per second. Our system, as you'll see today, uh, can, uh, demonstrated 622 megabits per second downlink from the moon. But this chart here on the x-axis you can actually see is the mass of the, of the entire system and, and the power consumed. And so LRO actually required over 60 kilograms for their system, including the, uh, the gimbal and the arm and the antenna, uh, the TWTs, all the things that make an RF system. And while we could transmit six times as much data, we used half the mass and 25% less power. So optical comm is more than just a bigger pipe back. It means that you can use these smaller masses and power consumptions to maybe put more instruments on your spacecraft you're sending to Mars or wherever it's going. So. Uh, Laser communications is used all the time in the Earth. As I said before, that's what powers our internet backbone. Uh, but doing it from space, what's the trick then? The trick is actually pointing this beam back uh, from the moon to the Earth. And to give you an idea of the magnitude of this problem, this is our White Sands complex, and it's bathed in red light, which is our beam coming back from the moon, which is a 15 microradian beam. This is 100 meters for scale, so if we step out by a factor of 10, you can see our six kilometer spot coming back from the moon. We're going to step out another factor of 10. And if you're familiar with uh, New Mexico, here's Las Cruces, which is the closest town to White Sands. It's about 25 kilometers away. You can already see our spot looks pretty small relative to that. Here we are in New Mexico. There's a little red dot down there. If you can see it. And here we are in the western U.S. And oh, by the way, this is what the, uh, the KA band RF system uh, has to deal with for pointing. It's a much easier pointing challenge. Uh, so this is what we see from the moon. So this was our biggest challenge, and actually, uh, uh, let me point out that our system was designed, built, and delivered by the MIT Lincoln Laboratory team, and they did a fantastic job here. I'll talk about the results coming up before I turn over to Dave. Uh, anyway, and the long, and the, the, the long of it is, is we never had any issues on any pass with pointing acquisition or tracking, and it was almost instantaneous lockup. So this problem has actually been solved and solved well. So here we are integrated on the LADI spacecraft uh, for size and scale. Here's a. Uh, one of the uh, LADI INT engineers. Here's our optical head payload uh, on the outside. This includes that small four inch telescope. There are optical fibers that couple into and out of this telescope for both the receiver for the uplink and the transmitter for the downlink. 
that go into our optical modem, which is here, which includes the, the transmit laser and the, the, the optical receiver. And then we have a computer down here. It's a distributed system that we use for the pointing and tracking. We had a beautiful launch on September 6th. We got to the moon, and so, you know, what were we there to prove? Uh, this was the first, it's, it's a demo. We weren't there really to do operations. We were actually there uh, to uh, just see if this concept would even work. So our level one requirements were to demonstrate 622 megabits down from the moon, 20 megabits on the uplink. And by the way, the, the, the highest uplink speed that's ever been demonstrated to the moon is four kilobits. I mean, folks are usually just sending commands, but if you're going to have astronauts at the moon or anywhere else in the future, they certainly would like to see their families by video or watch Netflix or watch the Super Bowl when the time comes. It's, I mean, you know, there are all these psychological issues of astronauts in deep space, and I think this would help to alleviate that. So 20 megabits per second on the uplink is, is, is an achievement from that standpoint. We also were able to do two-way time of flight and laser ranging, so we could do navigation with this, and that's a byproduct that falls out. So. This is a screenshot of our first pass that we took on October 17th uh, this past fall. Uh, if you look up here in the top corner, these were cameras that were co-located with our telescopes, actually going through our telescopes, and that little red dot is the one half of a watt of laser power looking like a little star coming back to the moon from us, uh, from the moon to us on the ground station. Uh, these are the, uh, the, the counts in the receiver. This is actually a photon counting receiver. I didn't say it before, but one of the breakthroughs that made this work is a, a brand new technology that allows you to count photons at the wavelength that we're at at a high enough rate to do these high data rates. And here on the bottom, you can see, of course, uh, the red curve is the instantaneous uh, code word error rate. And so we ran error free. Basically, once we set the pass up, we could run error free. And the blue is the 20 second average. So once this goes to zero, we're error free for a long time. This is the physical layer. So we're actually running error free on the physical layer. And of course, we know there are protocols well above us that take care of uh, errors as they pop up. Uh, as they come along later. Uh, the uplink also ran error-free. I don't have uplink screenshots, but uh, we had no issues with that. And so I, this is kind of a busy chart, but I'll just walk through it before I turn over the floor to Dave. What have we shown? Uh, we demonstrated regular and instantaneous uh, all optical acquisition and tracking between the space terminal and the ground. We were error-free all the time, as long as there wasn't a cloud involved, of, uh, on, on downlinks from 40 megabits per second all the way up to 311 megabits per second. And then we did also run 622 megabits per second pretty much all the time. We did have some small errors, uh, a code rate, uh, a code word error rate below 10 to the minus 5, and our requirement was 10 to the minus 4. And this is the code word error rate. So after the error correction, the bit error rate's about 10 to the minus 7. Uh, we were error free always on the uplinks. We did time of flight measurements for ranging. These, uh, the next one is actually an important point as well. We were able to operate when the moon was at very low elevations. We tracked the moon across the sky. And so if you take your arm and extend it and look at your fist, your fist subtends about five degrees. And so we were able to actually communicate air-free with the moon just above the horizon. And if you think about that, that's impressive because you're going through a lot of atmosphere. It's one way, it's one thing to go through straight ahead, you know, over the, at the zenith, but through all the atmosphere without having any kind of issues is, is a big deal. And then, we were also op able to operate in, in the daytime to within three degrees of the sun at full rate with no degradation in the performance. And so we're able to do basically what the Deep Space Network can do at this point. And we had some operational achievements that we threw in as well. We can send uplink commands and get the telemetry down over the optical link. Uh, we, we actually downloaded the LADI data buffer uh, several times. Uh, they had a one gigabyte uh, buffer for all their science data and other housekeeping data. We had a 40 megabit per second connection within LADI uh, from their buffer to our spacecraft um, into our terminal at 40 megabits per second. And so in five minutes, we could download that. If they were to do it over the S-band system, it would take uh, a few days if they downloaded the entire uh, buffer. We also streamed videos up and back. And if you go to our website, there's actually a wonderful video of Administrator Bolden that we streamed to the moon and back in HD quality. It's beautiful. You don't see any dropouts or anything. And uh, you can watch that. Uh, Bill Nye did a video for us just recently that just got posted on the Planetary Society page. Again, it's uh, uh, extremely high quality. And the fact that we can do the uplink allowed us to do the loopback, and Dave used that uplink to do his DTN experiment. And then finally, one of the last things we did before I turn the floor over to Dave, we're, we actually used uh, automated scripting to wake the terminal up on its own. So at an appointed time, the, ter the spacecraft came around the moon, and then it woke up the laser comm terminal, and the terminal pointed itself to the right place on the Earth, and we turned on the ground station, and they locked up automatically. So we didn't need any kind of RF assistance. And so 
operationally, we did uh, things that we were not expected to do even for this demonstration, and, and it really uh, worked very well. And so with that, we did a DTN demonstration. I give the floor to Dave Israel. Wow. Thank Thanks. So uh, as, as Don said, they had, uh, they had great success, and, and before the mission was, was launched, uh, I had gone over to Don's office, he's across the hall from me, and, and uh, floated this idea about doing a DTN demonstration. He was very supportive and all for it, but I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody on the project or the Lincoln guys until they had launched it and, and seen it, it work. So they did, they did uh, the, the hard part of uh, making it work. Um, Congress apparently did the harder part of like getting us off the furlough to, so that we could. <laughs> we lost we lost two out of our four weeks to get this experiment together by being uh, furloughed, and then uh, we scrambled together. And I'll describe the demonstration that that we did. So uh, this chart is just the highlights that that I'll go through. But uh, you'll you'll see that we d used the bundle protocol and uh, LTP uh, protocol over over the op optical link, so across the optical link. So. So an important uh, distinction from, from what uh, uh, JPL did with the Dynet ex experiment is that we never put any DTN software on the spacecraft it, it itself. We didn't have access to that. We, we were sending the, we used the links, but not the spacecraft itself. Um, and I'll, I think I'll cover the other uh, points here. So, so here's uh, what we had uh, working. We have uh, Laddie orbiting the moon communicating with white sands. So uh, the scenario that, that I, I devised for our ex experiment was to do a, a lunar relay scenario, and the optical link would be the trunk line between the Earth and, and the moon. So we needed some lunar users, so uh, pick some locations. So we have uh, the astronauts at Tranquility Base. We have our uh, science area of interest uh, found approximately 13 years ago, I guess it is now. Um, and then we have... Uh, uh, the, the far side, or it was a full moon, so the dark side of the moon, on, on the other on the other side. So, so, uh, so, yeah, I, I, I uh, picked these uh, locations uh, partly for, I guess, pop cultural reasons, and also uh, uh, to to be able to use the the orbit of uh, Laddie itself. We were using the real telemetry and the real orbital predictions to uh, determine when the Laddie spacecraft would be in view of each of these lunar surface locations. Uh, so that uh, we could do this uh, scenario, so we had uh, emulations of uh, data at each of these locations when the time came that Laddie would be in view of that spot on the surface, and we would exchange data with the relay, and the relay was not going to always be in contact with the Earth at the same time, and especially not when it was on the far side. So, so uh, Laddie went around, picked up the bundles, and then when the time came that, that the uh, Earth was in view, then uh, the trunk line uh, did its thing and sent all the bundles back. So using the orbital predictions, uh, then we were able to generate the mutual visibility time between the three locations and uh, the, the relay on Laddie. And then the actual uh, link itself for the trunk line was, was what played the role of, of the trunk line. And so to do this in, in the network uh, form, uh, again, all of these uh, nodes were located on, on the Earth, though uh, uh, virtually um, they were split between uh, the moon, a lunar relay, a ground station, and uh, uh, ground sta station or ground uh, mocks. So we have uh, on this, this diagram, uh, and, and uh, I should uh, back up and just say that, that some of these nodes were at, at an operations center up at MIT Lincoln Lab, and then some of these were, were down at, at Goddard. So we have uh, three nodes on the surface of, of the Earth. I mean, the surface of the moon that would communicate with, with our lunar relay node. So these were the links that, based on, on the predicted mutual, vis mutual visibility schedule, these were the links that would exchange the bundles with each other. Uh, uh, MIT Lincoln Lab uh, was the location that, that had the, uh, the links to get the data between uh, uh, on and off of, of the optical link itself. Even though the, the ground station was at uh, White Sands, we have there's a high data rate connection between White Sands and, uh, and Massachusetts, and that's where the, the uh, input and output of, of the data stream to go to and from uh, the optical link uh, uh, was. So, so up at Lincoln was, uh, was the connection to the optical side of the relay, and then uh, uh, they have a box out at uh, 
out at White Sands that didn't do anything with the, the data uh, contents it itself, but it was able to uh, take the data and put it on and off of, of the links, but also to, to take what was really a, a loopback and split up the, the data so that it, it functionally worked for us as if we had two bi-directional links uh, happening. Um, and then it would, it would come back uh, through Lincoln and back down uh, to, uh, to Goddard where we had, had our mocks. So this was, was our, our network. Uh, we were able to capture data of, of the bundle, bundle flows. Uh, we were running uh, the bundle protocol over TCP for, for everything except for what was uh, going over the optical link itself. And, and those, uh, you, you see the LTP over, over U, UDP. Uh, the UDP got, got stripped off at the, at the moon link box. So it was uh, the bundle protocol over LTP in, inside the, the, the data structure that already existed at, uh, for the optical link. Okay, so, so here's, uh, here's what happened. Now, now the, uh, it was interesting, I, um, when I was putting these slides together, then the, the optical link guys wanted to make sure that I used the slide that showed the error-free uh, data you know, in, that, in that earlier part. But, but it, it's, uh, and, and it is kind of a, a, a hazard in, 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 a, in a way for, for Spacecom, if your data is always error-free at the physical layer, then perhaps you're wasting too much power on, on, your, on your link. You know, you, you should, so, so this is an area that we're going to continue to explore about uh, tuning the overall system to uh, if, if you have a retransmission protocol, then maybe you can take it easier on your com link requirements. Uh, or if you have a really great link, then, then why are you wasting your time with this retransmission protocol? So, so we need to find that, that place in between. So, so here's, uh, uh, let, let's take a close look at this data. So, so what this graph is showing is the, the blue dots are when we were periodically sending out uh, bundles. And in this case, we had uh, uh, image files, uh, and, and each uh, file was put in its own bundle, and we, we would send it through, through the link. And then the red dots show when, when the bundle uh, came back through. So in the beginning, uh, the link was working out uh, great, and the bundles made it through. Then, uh, uh, fortunately for me, maybe not for the optical link guys, but a, a cloud came through. So we had this, this period of about uh, two hours, I'm um, sorry, two, two minutes, uh, where, where the link went away. So we had uh, uh, two displays, one where we could see the pictures that we were sending going out, and another one where we could see the pictures uh, come back. So uh, the, the link goes out, the optical comm guys are upset because of the cloud, and, uh, and we're just waiting to see what happens. So the link uh, comes back, and this is where, where uh, we finally got to see see uh, the, the bundle protocol and LTP do, do its magic. All of these bundles here that were sent during this time frame, when the link came back, there they are, all, there they are uh, showing up. Uh, it, nobody promised they'd be delivered in order, so you, so you, you can see that, that uh, they came out of order, but they, they all uh, made it through. And, and as a, a personal aside, I, know, I knew that it, it worked without seeing the data because I was watching the pictures go. I had a, a a series of pictures with with Adrian and a and Adrian and, and Merle and they they were all kind of sent up together and then the link went out and then when I was watching the pictures come back then they weren't in the same order when they when they came through so it was just kind of uh, kind of nice that it turned out to be those, those pictures that, that I saw so so then when the link comes back then you can see that that uh, the buffers get get cleared out and kind of uh, converges back and then uh, 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 the optical link guys were happy because the link stayed great uh, the rest of the way through and you see the bundles uh, go. So this is the same event uh, uh, more from the, from the beginning, but in this case, I just plotted the, uh, the delivery delay time uh, with respect to the time that the bundle was first uh, sent out uh, and then with the same kind of uh, uh, link performance uh, curve at, at the top there. So you can see, as you would expect, these bundles that were sent during this time period when the link was bad then uh, they made it through, but it took much longer for them to make it through. And then here you see the, the uh, buffers getting cleared out, and then things uh, converge back down, and then the link went out, and you have the same, same effect again. So, so, with, uh, uh, so with this, then, then we could see that, that uh, the BP and LTP were taking care of, of uh, getting that data completeness uh, through, through the outages that were due to uh, clouds and the atmospheric uh, effects. Okay, so then the, the other uh, part that, that that data didn't show is uh, I wanted, uh, and this was what, um, uh, what the whole relay scenario was, was about, was to, to, to uh, 
illustrate the the uh, the networking and the muxing and the demuxing and the store and forward part of it. So so here's a series of uh, plots that I'll overlay on top of each other. So the first this is uh, data that was originating on the relay and and so the two lines that you see the blue is uh, the data being sourced bundles being sourced on board the relay and the red is when they make it down all the way to the to the final box. So I left out. Um, uh, the, the, some of the stops in between to make it a, a little bit cleaner. So, so here uh, you can see that, that the, uh, the relay is, was sending out data. So this was its own data. Uh, if you want to put it in an operational scenario, this was maybe a, a, a science instrument that's on board the orbiter and it's sending its, its data. And there you can see some delay to when the data came, came back. Um, now what, I, what I've uh, overlaid on top is, is uh, is the data from uh, uh, the time when the relay was was over uh, Tranquility Base? So you can see that, that right when it came on board Tranquility Base, and then uh, all of these queued up uh, bundles waiting at Tranquility Base uh, uh, were transmitted up and into the the relay and uh, sent out once that, that pipe opened up. And then uh, here's when they finally make it through to uh, uh, to the mock on the Earth side. Um, it was later during that same pass that that, uh, that the uh, TMA one location was was uh, in view of the relay, and here you can see that that the bundles uh, again they were sort of backlogged and so they worked their way up into the relay, uh, but those bundles uh, didn't get uh, delivered during this pass. And so if you uh, put them all on on top of each other, then then this is uh, uh, all all three. And it's probably hard to to see the different uh, color differences, but you can see where where uh, the tranquility base uh, uh, bundles are making it to their mock. Here's where the lunar relay base uh, uh, lunar relay data is making it to its mock. Um, and then this this uh, data from the uh, TMA one location made it to the relay, but didn't make it you know all the way all the way through. So this delay in, in the beginning. Uh, is from from the uh, lockup of, of the optical link. Uh, we we had uh, some some software issues. Uh, the you know, reality kind of happened with our test configuration that, that led to uh, these bundles not being delivered uh, here. Um, uh, and then the, and then the time of the link uh, went went out. So so we uh, it's it's really just just last week that I was finally able to go through the data and find a way to correlate it and, and plot it. To, to produce these graphs to get to see what, what happens. So, so now that we have this this data, then now we're starting to to go back through and, and make sure that we can really explain, you know, how how much of this characteristic is due to the link itself, how much was from uh, the way LTP was working, how much was just based on our implementation or bottlenecks in other parts of the system. So uh, we're still working through that. Uh, another uh, interesting thing that that came out of this uh, um, uh, this experiment. Uh, sort of out of out of necessity, and, and uh, Vint touched upon this in in, in his uh, introduction, was uh, was kind of uh, we we had this need to uh, to see what was was happening. And we were running this experiment. We wanted to know whether it was was working. Uh, we we could uh, we could cheat because all the the nodes were really on on the Earth and, and in view, even uh, when in our uh, virtual reality they they weren't. But but we were still doing th this. Uh, Experiment with with lots of different nodes and lots of different data flows and uh, and a short uh, opportunity to make it happen. We just really wanted to see how, how it was. So so uh, late late nights in the mock will lead to the development of this, which we call the the, uh, the French fry plot, um, where so you had you had these different uh, uh, bars that would uh, so we have this one axis is the location that bundles are are being queued up. Uh, where, where the bundles are being queued, and then the other axis is uh, destination nodes. So, for example, uh, this uh, this French fry here is uh, uh, bundles that are on board the the relay that are headed um, that are waiting to get back to the mock from from uh, Tranquility Base, uh, for uh, for example. So, um, so this was uh, done kind of uh, on the on the spot in the mock using a, a GNU uh, plot. Uh, we were able to rotate it to get get uh, different different uh, perspectives of you know if we really wanted to focus on where the queues were being bundled versus like where they were going to, and uh, real time we could we could start to watch the uh, the the stacks kind of come and go as the links came up, 
And, uh, and since we, we did this, and, and now we, we've kind of are working forward to come up with other, uh, other enhancements to, to show the links that, that are active, um, uh, knowing that, that uh, in a, a DTN situation, uh, you're not always going to have contact with, with things, and then even when you do, you, you may look, be looking at the most recent data you have, but it could be minutes to hours old. So, so we're working on, on ways to graphically uh, put on the same graph so, so uh, uh, a network operator can, can get the, the best information that they can at the time with, uh, quickly and, and uh, visualize it. Uh, we're talking about being able to plot. You know, have one mode where you look at this is what is predicted, what you think should be happening now. This is the most recent data that you have. And do some comparisons and some things to, to help you diagnose how, how, the, how the network is, is doing. So, so that just kind of came out of, uh, of us trying to, to run this experiment. Okay, so, uh, so our uh, laser comm scenarios uh, uh, within NASA, so uh, there's the, the Mars Orbiter uh, example, uh, which, which LLCD uh, demonstrated a, um, uh, quite a bit of what would be uh, required for, for an optical link uh, for, to, to Mars. And there are the advantages. There's that, that low uh, size, weight, and power uh, you get that higher bandwidth that you can get from uh, RF, and that's where you would use this uh, PPM or photon counting to, to really get your data at, at uh, low, uh, uh, low uh, photon counts. Uh, in a near-Earth scenario where, the, where you have uh, more photons to go around, then that's where you would use a different modulation, uh, such as uh, DPSK, differential phase shift king, and, uh, and there's a demonstration that, that I'm the principal investigator for that's scheduled to, to fly in the 2017-2018 time period that, that will have um, uh, lengths about a, a one and a quarter gigabit per, per second and, uh, and have, have the relay. So uh, besides uh, this kind of next generation TDRS or a, a Mars case, there's also cases of uh, direct uh, LEO to, to ground, I think uh, Earth, Earth science missions or, or a mission where instead of uh, uh, dumping your data over a polar orbiter. If you had a high enough data rate, you just wait until uh, it's uh, a clear day over top of where your science ops center is and just blast all your data down uh, when, when you flew over, uh, for example. And then uh, things like CubeSats that maybe don't need the high data rates, but you know something like the size of a laser pointer could get all the data that they need off, uh, off of their uh, mission. Um, so uh, so all, all these uh, scenarios would, would certainly benefit from, uh, from, from DTN from the, the uh, scheduled outages, the rate buffering, and, and then when the links that you're going through the atmosphere, really uh, uh, it's, it's clearly a, a good thing to, to help you with, with that issue. Uh, so uh, LCRD, which is, uh, uh, I mentioned, is this follow-on uh, mission. Uh, it'll be a uh, hosted payload with, with two optical terminals uh, uh, based on uh, what's coming out of uh, the LLCD flight it's going to be hosted on a spacecraft being uh, built by Space Systems Laurel right uh, down the street uh, from here. And um, we'll do the PPM up to 311 megabits per second and uh, the DPSK up to one and a quarter gigabits per second. And uh, we have two ground stations, one in uh, Table Mountain, uh, the JPL Octal facility, and then an upgrade of, of the LLGT that, that Don uh, showed out of White Sands. And uh, we will be operating for, instead of a 30-day experiment that LLCD was, it'll be two years of, of operations where we'll really be uh, going that next step besides just proving the technology but learning how best to, to, to operate it. So uh, currently, the um, uh, DTN was uh, part of the original uh, plans for LCRD, but uh, budgets and, and things uh, have, have a way of descoping missions, and, and uh, DTN is no longer on board uh, LCRD. But we'll, we'll still have the capability to do the similar type of experiments of, of what we did uh, uh, for L, um, LLCD. And then uh, there, there is a, a project um, uh, being, being proposed to fly an optical terminal on, on LEO, in a, in a LEO payload, uh, because uh, we're trying to demonstrate with LCRD like a, a future uh, NASA TDRS uh, space network uh, relay capability. So, our uh, LCRD payload will be capable of, of tracking a LEO orbiter for the optical link. We just don't have a LEO orbiter as part of our particular uh, project. So, so uh, the, the uh, hopes are that, that we'll get a LEO orbiter opportunity, maybe the space station, maybe somebody else, 
and uh, and then I'll certainly be trying to make DTM part of what flies on that that Leo uh, payload. Um, some more uh, details about L LCRD. Um, I don't. Uh, I, th I think I'll, I'll skip over this just to get get to uh, to the conclusions and leave a little time for for any questions there might be. So so the LLCD experiment. Uh, as, as Don showed, did did reach all of all of its uh, goals and, and then some for optical com, and then that success was what really let us uh, take advantage of it and and put the DTN on top of it. And and uh, I really do think uh, like like uh, within DTN within NASA, um, we, we've had we've I think we've really had a hard time finding like that that killer application that thing that'll that'll really make people put DTN into their systems and uh, with. Uh, uh, with the optical com and people's desire to go to optical com and clouds, then then uh, I, I think um, uh, DTN uh, can work itself into the architecture, uh, just starting off as, as a way to, to deal with the clouds and the atmosphere. And then once it's on board, then suddenly you have all these other networking benefits and, and things that'll that'll come from it. Okay. okay. Any uh, questions for myself or Don? Yes? Yes. What, was there any uh, distinction in capability between daytime and nighttime? Uh, I'll, I'll let Diane answer that, but, but no, we, I don't believe they saw, saw any. From the physical link standpoint, no, not at all. So just an observation. Uh, given the, uh, the two talks that we've heard uh, so far, it's, it seems to me that uh, we're seeing a kind of liftoff here because this is the first time we've seen very practical experiments being done with real results using these protocols. And so I'm really excited about the potential here. Uh, you know, exponential things don't look like much when they start, uh, but this one feels like uh, you've just cracked the, the nut. So I'm really excited about it. Thanks. Yeah, so one question for you on this. Um, since we're actually, start, like uh, Vint was saying, we're actually starting to see real results and real things. And interestingly, you have the experience of being able to have run your experiment without DTN and then with the DTN layer on top of it. Did you notice um, major impacts to any kind of your margins, say the link margins or the data rates or any kind of overhead, um, any kind of uh, benchmarks that uh, system designers would be able to use going forward to predict how DTN might impact their designs? Yeah, so and how so they that's, a, it? that's a good question. So, so one, one of the... Uh, the first things that we notice is, is just sort of uh, the, the data completeness uh, uh, part of it. So, so that that same time period uh, that I showed the the outage, that two minutes, that would have been two minutes of uh, complete data loss if it was not for the, the storage and, and the retransmission. So there was that that benefit. But but one of the other things that uh, that that we've noticed, and now we're, we're talking about uh, um, uh, if we get an opportunity in March or April to test is to now adjust uh, uh, the, the coding scheme and what's being used on the, on the physical layer to perhaps uh, see what we can do with, with the simpler coding and decoding, something that's uh, both less complex and maybe doesn't in, in, uh, incur as much latency on the data delivery, and then uh, make the link good enough so that then the, the DTM protocols can take care of the rest and then end up with, uh, there's always this sort of trade-off between uh, latency requirements and, and data completeness requirements. So we're trying to to spread those requirements between the physical layer and, and the network protocols. Yeah, I have I have something to add to that just quickly. Yeah. So so as Dade said, we spend a lot of money getting the physical layer to 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 meet these really difficult requirements. And if we could really loosen up the requirements on the physical layer using DTN, I think we'd save a lot of money with this. I mean, and, and you know, money money talks, of course, in the, in all of our businesses. So. Yeah. Uh, two things. One is that Maria Uden has graciously granted you an additional five minutes for questions. <laughs> um, and I do have a question. Um, so what do you see as kind of the practical uh, distance limitation for this approach? I mean, there, you know, the moon is, you know, relatively close and you're not going to have a you know, huge amount of, you know, signal degradation. Uh, okay, so so for, I think that's more about the optical link than, than yeah, yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. So so to give you a, a point of reference, uh, the moon is four hundred thousand kilometers away, and at its furthest, Mars is four hundred million kilometers yeah. away. So there's a thousand times distance change, 
And the way range loss drops off is by the square. So it's basically a million times harder to do it from Mars. Now that said, so there's 60 dB to be recovered in a link budget. You can turn the, you know, we have space qualified transmitters now where we could up the power by 10 dB. You can go and instead of using our small ground system, maybe use the Hale Telescope, Mount Palomar. You got five meters, you know, that goes up by the square of that. There are ways to recover that. You can come down on the bandwidth. You know, 600 megabits you don't necessarily need from Mars if you could get, you know, a few dB by coming down to 60 or 250 or something like that. So there are trades. The JPL team, uh, the JPL Optical Comm team, has a design called Deep Space Optical Terminal. It's, it's on paper right now, but they have a concept to close that link, and, and that's really where Optical Comm gets very attractive, but I think it even looks good from the moon, personally. Yeah, but well, that's actually very encouraging, you know, because it, it could have more practical, you know, applications for, like, communications to Mars. So, thanks very much. Sure. Okay. So, so the question was about a persistent cloud cover and how long does it take for retransmission and how long could it, could it wait? So, so this is actually another part of, of what we've been, been studying where DTN uh, can help. Is, is, uh, so the answer really comes back to, uh, um, well, first, it's, it's how long can your users wait for their, for their data is part of it. But then, uh, but then it's, it's how much storage do you have on, on the relay it, itself? So, so one of the, one of the, the issues that, that DTN and the Storm Forward also helps with the larger optical comm network uh, architecture and design is that because of uh, cloud outages, you want to have uh, as many ground stations as, as possible in different places so, uh, so that um, you know it's clear at at least one of them. So if you were trying to get 100% uh, availability, then you would want to have uh, you know a, um, a, a lot of ground stations, and you can. You can uh, kind of dial your requirements to make it so that you need anywhere from five to twelve and 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 beyond. But if if you uh, if you have the the storage on, on board, um, then and the people can can wait to store it, and you and you lower that requirement a little bit, uh, then then you can start to bring down the number of of ground stations. And then this, this is where where the the uh, uh, the the other issue that that uh, or you, if you had multiple optical links all coming from the spacecraft down. Then you could you could have all these links available so that if it gets cloudy on one, you can kind of instantaneously go to to another one. But then that that becomes expensive. So where DTN helps in in that case is that if you can do a handover quickly with one optical link, then then the disruption in that case is that you had to stop your link in this place and switch over and start communicating at, at that place. So that's another spot where where the the data system and the things above the physical layer are just doing their thing and all the disruptions you know, look alike. And then un underneath, uh, you're, you're really just handing off from one place to, to the other. Uh, but but that, that question really is one that's, that's sort of got a lot of variables that we're always adjusting to try and to come up with that optimum system. Thanks. I do have one more thing okay. for that. Sure. So we had, we had three, three separate ground systems, and our availability due to clouds was, was 92%. So it's, it's the 8% of the time that you have to deal with for a site diversity, or you have more ground systems. Okay. Yeah. You, you also have to go to places that, that are, are clear, <laughs> you know, clear view. Uh, one of the issues, though, I guess related to that is uh, the locations that the astronomical telescopes are located, you know, up on top of mountains and, uh, you know, these really great places with clear views do not necessarily and, and usually don't have high bandwidth uh, data links off of their their uh, locations, so this is a, a case where uh, either we have to go to spots with uh, less uh, seeing uh, uh, parameters but better data rates, or uh, this is another part where, where DTN helps because it kind of provides this natural rate buffering capability where where the high rate link could be from space down to the ground station, and then the the low rate link is uh, from your location of your, your telescope to, uh, to the rest of the world. Is there any chance that we could have an excuse to spend the long-term experiment in Maui? So, <laughs> so, if, so if, if you look at, at the, uh, the proposal for the LCRD mission, then one of the links is going down to Hawaii. Uh, it, gets, it was since moved off of Hawaii, but there's a chance it might end up back there. So, you know. I'll send you an invitation if we go back there. <laughs>